Okay, this is part two of our radio theory. In this part, we're going to look at the IF. And in it, it consists of two IF transformers and IF amplifier. And we're going to discuss exactly how it works and the principles of theory and operation. It's pretty simple to a certain extent. Uh, we have our signal coming in from our mixer. Now, if you recall from before, this will consist of several frequencies. The IF is made up, IF transformer is made up of two tuned circuits. They're both tank circuits or bandpass circuits, and they're designed to only allow one frequency through, which in this case is 455 kilohertz, which is pretty much the standard IF on most later receivers. Now, the filter on the input will block out the, everything but 455 and couple it to L2 here, the output, which then will in turn go to the grid of our amplifier and be amplified come out the plate, go to the next input of the next transformer. Again, staying at 455, this will only allow 455 through, be coupled to the secondary, and be sent out to our detector tube. Now, these transformers are rather interesting. Uh, the ones in this particular radio when you do alignment, have adjustable capacitors. Now there are some are designed where the capacitors are fixed and they have slugs in the coils that you adjust. These on the other hand have the adjustable capacitors. When you, if you ever tear an IF transformer apart, uh, the coils are wrapped separately from each other, uh, the primary and the secondary and uh, kept at a certain distance from each other. They have no iron core. They're not like a regular transformer, like your power transformer, your audio output transformer, which both have iron cores. These are what is considered a fairly loose coupling, meaning that the mutual inductance is fairly weak between them. And what that allows for is a wave that is uh, shows up on a scope, oh, something kind of like this. It peaks real good. It's fairly narrow and allows only just certain frequencies through. It'll block out everything else and uh, attenuate them or reduce their signal strength fairly quickly once you get from the center point, which would be at 455. Now, if you move these two coils closer together, or tighten the coupling, this will broaden out. And it'll start broadening out a little wider and a little wider until you get to a point that it actually kind of looks like this. And at that point, it's any more further would start creating two actual very distinct peaks. Some TVs use IFs like this, where they overcouple the transformers in their IFs to get something towards this effect. It's fairly broad band, and that way they can get the broad bandness that they need. But in radios, we want something like this. So we keep the transformers uh, fairly loosely coupled. Now, some other things about the circuit, and the whole purpose of the IF circuit, and the whole purpose of superheterodyne, this is the second part of what superheterodyne really means. The first part was the mixer tube and the local oscillator, and then this part. Radios before this were what they called tuned radio frequency, or TRF, TRF radios. And they were designed with tuned RF amplifiers. Uh, what they did was 
they'd have they could have three four or more RF stages some cheaper ones might have had only two but the idea was you had to R, had to amplify that RF signal to have something usable when it got to the detector so it'd be strong enough to operate the detector properly as well as then have a strong enough signal coming out of the detector that with amplification you could actually even use a loudspeaker instead of having to rely on headphones but there were some bad problems with tuned radio frequency uh, first of all you had several stages of amplification that you had to try to keep tuned and try to keep them equally tuned they also had to be fairly broadband plus you also had an amplifier that you was trying to tune over a wide range of frequencies and if you ever hook up a, a scope to just like a signal generator or something you'll notice as you rotate the dial the strength may vary the height of the wave well the same thing happened in tune radio frequency radios they didn't keep a constant strength because the amplifiers had to tune over a large wide band range of frequencies and then one other little problem they had with them was people were starting to get interested in listening to shortwave TRF radios due to the problems with the tuning due to the problems with the amp amplifiers operating at such a high frequency and everything would not operate without feedback at high frequencies such as shortwave uh, it was bad enough with broadcast band that's how come if you ever get a TRF radio you'll find that it has a lot of shielding in it uh, the more application you added more stages more big problem you had with feedback from the first stage from the last stage to the first stage that was seriously a problem when you got to high frequencies they just could not do anything with it, it you couldn't shield it enough to stop that problem so what do you do well that's when superheterodyne was invented and the beauty of it is is most typical radios will have just one stage amplification that's all that's necessary but you can find radios where you'll have two or three amplifiers in here and it's perfectly fine it just gets a stronger and stronger signal the beauty of this is this does not have to vary it's tuned to 455 kilohertz in this particular radio and that's where it's built and designed and works around that one frequency so it's this tube is set up this amplifier is set up to operate most efficiency at that efficiently at that frequency and any other stages past that and I won't get any feedback any problems with that because of the IFs these tuned filtered circuits are highly tuned as you can see with the wave that they will not allow much feedback to give any troubles now it's not saying that you can take the cans off and not have some troubles you can but they are well tuned circuits and they all have to deal with one frequency so they can be tuned extremely well to them frequencies there's not a whole lot I can say more about this um, there's a few other things that goes in deeper into theory but I think I'll let that uh, go in when we talk about tubes and stuff especially it deals more with the converter or the mixer tube and some of the problems that can happen there but the uh, one thing that I can talk about is why 455 kilohertz one of the big problems that you have with a superheterodyne that can happen with it is the fact that is what is known as ghost image if you have say a station that it's a weak station say at, at one frequency a low frequency 
and you have a nerve station that is basically double the IF frequency that is a strong station the possibility exists that in the mixer those two could be herodyne together and be you know they'll be the 455 kilohertz and they could make it through the IFs because it, all the IF cares about is the 455 kilohertz so they can make it through as well as the weak station that is supposed to be making it through and go all the way to your output and the reason why you can pick up that strong station along with the weak station is because your input circuit is fairly broadband so it, it don't attenuate as very well as much as these guys will these guys are extremely do a real good job attenuating anything beyond 455 well the thing is what they found out in broadcast was that the lower the IF frequency the better the selectivity but the more apt you're going to get a ghost image the higher the IF you reduce your selectivity but you also reduce the chances of getting a ghost image there had to be a compromise made and 455 is where they agreed was the best compromise due to various reasons one was the fact that getting that wide of a band between a weak station and a strong station on the AM band is very unlikely and so the ghost images at 455 doesn't mean they can't happen but they're very unlikely yet at 455 we still have good enough selectivity that the radio works pretty good and we don't have to worry about adjacent channels giving us too much troubles now that's about all I can think of to talk about this um, if there's any questions just leave them and I can always do a t part two on this the next part will be on the detector and uh, and how it operates in an automatic volume control. So, thank you.